let's explore the income statement in more detail. As we previously talked about, financial statements are truly a communication tool. They are designed to provide information to many types of readers of financial statements. So as a result, the income statement is consistently broken out into several different and unique sections. Let me take you through those sections in a lot more detail now. The income statement starts at the top with revenues. Now, revenues can also be referred to as sales. It sometimes is referred to as turnover. It really represents the income that a company receives from selling goods or services. Below revenue, we have typically direct operating expenses. So that could be, for example, purchasing inventory. This line is often called cost of goods sold, cost of sales, COGS for short, and it's typically the first expense line item on the income statement. Now, after deducting our direct operating expenses from revenues, we arrive at our first subtotal on the income statement, and we call this gross profit. Gross profit is simply revenue minus direct operating expenses. Now, whatever remains as gross profit can be used by the company to cover other indirect operating costs, interest costs, the costs related to taxes, and so on. Next on the income statement come the indirect operating costs. So this could be things like selling expenses, distribution expenses, administration expenses. Sometimes these are listed as individual line items, but sometimes they're grouped together in just one line item called selling general and admin expenses, or SG&A for short. If we take our revenues and then deduct both our direct operating costs and our indirect operating costs, we arrive at our next profit subtotal called EBITDA, or earnings before, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. In accounting, the terms earnings, profit, and income really all mean the same thing. So when someone talks about earnings, they're talking about profit. Someone may be using the term income and they're talking about profit, but just be aware that there are many synonyms that are used to refer to the same thing. Next, we deduct depreciation and amortization expense, which relates to the assets we are using in the business. Now, we're going to cover depreciation in more detail later in the course. Our next profit line is EBIT, which stands for Earnings Before interest, and taxes. This line is also sometimes referred to as the operating profit or operating income. I like to think of it as the operating lifeblood of a business. Now, once we go below the EBIT line on the income statement, we then start looking at different types of expenses, such as taxes and debt financing costs. The next direct line is the cost of debt financing. So this includes things like interest expense and bank charges. And after deducting these interest expenses, there's often another subtotal for earnings, which is called earnings before tax. Below that, we deduct taxes and we finally arrive at net income, also referred to commonly as the bottom line. Net income can also be called net earnings or net profit. Whatever the case, this is the bottom line of the income statement, which then feeds into the retained earnings account on the balance sheet. There is one thing that makes the income statement very, very different from the balance sheet, and that relates to time. The balance sheet shows the position of a company at a point in time. You can think of it like a snapshot or photograph on one specific date. The income statement, however, shows the results of operations over a period of time. It captures all of the revenue and all the expenses that occurred during that specific period of time. The period of time reported really depends on the reporting requirements or needs of the company. So for example, publicly traded companies in North America typically report both quarterly and annually. However, in countries like the UK, Germany, and Australia, to name just a few more countries, publicly traded companies report to shareholders twice a year, semi-annually and annually. When it comes to accounting, there's a really important concept 
that I want to explore with you now, and it's called the matching principle. Basically, if a company spends money to make money, that spending needs to be recorded at the same time as the revenue it generates. There are two different kinds of entries that accountants make. The first type are regular entries that happen all the time, like recording sales or receiving a payment or paying a cash expense. The second type are what we call adjusting entries. These typically happen at the end of a period. Maybe it's a month, a quarter, or a year. And they're used to make sure that everything is properly accounted for. They're typically not related to -to day-to-day activities, but instead they're used to make sure that any expenses or revenues that it might have been recorded incorrectly are essentially fixed. Now, in this course, we'll be talking about a few different types of adjusting entries, like prepayments, unearned revenue, depreciation and amortization, and accruals of expenses and revenues. Hey, but don't worry. I'm going to talk you through those terms as we go along. Let's start with something called prepayments. So imagine you're buying an insurance policy. Now, typically, you have to pay for that policy up front, and it's typically for a year or maybe even more. Since that insurance policy expires over time or over 12 months, let's say, it can't really be considered an expense right away in the current month. Instead, we need to treat that expense and spread that expense over the 12 months. So when we first pay for the insurance policy, We record it as an asset called prepaid insurance or simply prepayments. And it's because this policy is going to provide us a benefit over the future 12 months. So to start, we record the transaction. We would debit prepaid insurance. Remember when we increase an asset, we debit it. And we credit cash because we're decreasing cash as an asset. Now, as time goes on, we're going to make adjustments to reflect how the policy is expiring. Let's take a look at a real concrete example so we can all better understand how this process actually works. So imagine again that you've purchased a 12-month annual insurance policy for $12,000. So in a way, this means you're making a prepayment upfront for 12 months of insurance coverage with each month essentially costing $1,000, just taking the $12,000, dividing it by 12 months. Now, as each month goes by, a portion of that insurance policy expires and can no longer be considered an asset. To account for this, we need to record the expired amount as an expense for that month. This is done by debiting the insurance expense and crediting the prepaid insurance account. It's important to note that this adjusting entry affects both the income statement and the balance sheet. The income statement is going to be impacted because now there is an insurance expense that's increasing, which is going to decrease our profitability. The balance sheet is impacted because the prepaid insurance asset account decreases each month as the insurance policy expires. Let's turn to another example of a prepayment or prepaid expense. Let's suppose this time that a business purchases office supplies in bulk at certain times of the year, simply to ensure that they always have enough to meet the needs of the office. Just like insurance policies, there is a future economic benefit associated with those supplies stored in the office, still waiting to be used. Since the supplies have not yet been consumed, they can't be recorded as an expense when they were just purchased. As a result, when purchases are made, we would record a debit to supplies, which would be an asset account, and a credit to cash or accounts payable. Now, when the supplies are used up, we would then record a debit to the supplies expense and a credit to the supplies asset account, which is thereby reducing our asset by the amount used and showing it on the income statement as an expense. This is done as an adjusting entry because it's not practical to track the use of office supplies on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. However, someone will perform a count of the supplies at least at the end of the year or possibly take an inventory and then adjust the expense based on the count of the supplies. Let's put some numbers to this to make this example really come alive. So we're going to assume 
that a company purchased supplies worth $10,000 for cash. To initially record the transaction, we would credit the cash account with $10,000 because we're reducing an asset, but we debit another asset account that we'll call supplies asset account. These supplies are an asset right now of the company, typically a current asset because we'll expect to use them up in the next 12 months. Now, let's assume that at the end of the reporting period, there are still 2,000 worth of supplies left. We've essentially consumed 8,000 worth of supplies. So we need to make an adjustment to the supplies asset account and also create a supplies expense. So to do this, we record a debit to the supplies expense account on the income statement because we're increasing in expense, but we credit the supplies asset account because we're decreasing that by 8,000. This effectively reduces the supplies asset account to the 2,000, which was determined at the year end inventory count. We're now gonna turn to something called unearned or deferred revenue. It's quite common for customers to pay for goods or services that they will receive at a later date. So for instance, deposits can be made on houses, cars, event spaces, amongst other things. Let's say an event center rents out its space for conferences. When a deposit is made for a conference, the company is receiving the deposit upfront, but would record this amount as unearned revenue or deferred revenue. This is a liability account on the balance sheet because the company, the event center, has an obligation to provide the good or service in the future. In other words, it owes the service, hence the name liability. At the end of the period, let's say it's a year, the business needs to evaluate the value of their unearned revenue to determine if the obligation still exists or if they've delivered the service or good and then can record that unearned revenue as actual revenue on the income statement. So for instance, if a deposit was made for a conference center to hold the space for a planned event, once the event takes place, the company reduces the unearned revenue liability and records the amount received as revenue. After conducting this type of assessment, any revenue that has been earned would be taken out of unearned revenue, and that's a debit, and moved to revenue on the income statement, which you may recall is a credit. The final type of adjusting entry I'd like to talk you through is something called accruals. Sometimes companies reach the end of their reporting period, let's say it's a 12 months or a year, and realize they just haven't had a chance to record all their transactions. This can happen for a wide range of reasons. I'll just give you one. Perhaps a company is so busy with work that they've done the work, but they haven't had time to prepare and send out the invoices for that work before the end of the year. So even though the invoices haven't been sent out, we still need to reflect the fact that in the current accounting year, we should have earned and we did earn revenue. So what do we do? We need to record revenue on the income statement and we'll credit revenue, but we also need to debit accounts receivable, recognizing that we have customers that owe us money for the work that we've done, even though we haven't invoiced them for that work yet. This is gonna therefore update both the income statement with an increase in revenue, and it's gonna increase the balance sheet with an increase under current assets under accounts receivable. The same thing can happen with expenses. We may have expenses that we incurred, but they haven't been recorded yet. Either we're too busy, or maybe we haven't got the invoice yet from our vendor or supplier. But even though we haven't actually maybe received the bill from our supplier, we still need to record the amount of the expense owed on our financial statements. The entry that we would do to reflect this is we would accrue expenses, which would be to debit an expense account related to whatever the expense was, utilities or telephone, that would increase our expense, but we'd also credit what we owe to our suppliers. And recall, we call that accounts payable, and that is a current liability.